Uh, I'm going to talk about some joint work with Eric Blade uh, on approximating Boolean functions with the two circuits. So uh, we're going to be concerned with DNFs, which is a very simple object. It's the OR of ends. I'm going to call each N a term. Uh, and I'm going to be cons uh, concerned with two complexity measures of DNFs, two very basic ones, the size and the width. The size of the DNF is just the number of terms in a DNF. The width of a term is the number of literals occurring in the term. And the width of a DNF is just the maximum width of any term occurring in the DNF. OK, so that's what a DNF is. It's a very simple mathematical object. Um, in this talk, it may be useful to visualize a DNF as the union of subcubes. Uh, in particular, a size s with WDNF is the union of s subcubes of dimension at least n minus w. Uh, and the correspondence should be clear. Uh, every term corresponds to a subcube. The one thing I just want to emphasize is that a term of small width corresponds to a cube of large dimension. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to switch back and forth between viewing a DNF as you know, a circuit and the DNF as the union of subcubes. OK, so that's what a DNF is. OK, so the starting point of this research is a very simple exercise that's often used to introduce complexity theory. Uh, it's a very simple exercise. It says that any DNF that computes parity, the parity function, has to have size at least 2 to the n minus 1 and width at least n. OK, and it's not hard to prove. You just notice that every one input has to have its own subcube. And that's the proof. Uh, and this is a classic example of a lower bound in like, you know, a concrete model of computation. Equally easy is the fact that, in fact, every Boolean function can be computed by a DNF of size n most 2 to the n minus 1 and trivially with n most n. So combining, combining these two facts, we see that parity is, in fact, the hardest function. OK, so nothing, nothing too difficult going on here. In general, we have a fairly good understanding of the DNF complexity of functions, uh, just because they're not very complicated objects. But in this talk, I'm going to be interested in a slight twist, where the DNF doesn't have to compute the function exactly, but it's just required to be correct on a 0.99 fraction of inputs. And what I hope to convince you is that with this slight twist, you know, these like, simple exercises become interesting open problems. So let me get the key definition, hopefully the only definition of the talk out of the way. I'm going to say that a Boolean function f is an epsilon approximator for Boolean function g if they differ on an epsilon fraction of inputs. OK, so that's really the only definition we need. OK, let me start with three questions that we didn't quite know the answer to at the start of this research. Uh, the first question is, is approximating parity asymptotically easier than computing it exactly? We saw that computing parity, you require roughly 2 to the n terms, 2 to the n minus 1 terms. Can you, do, can you 0 0.1 approximate parity with size you know, 2 to the n over log n, or 2 to the n over poly n? So that's the first question. Uh, that's the first question that's slightly specific to parity. The second question is a more global question. Uh, we saw that parity is the hardest function to compute exactly. Is it also the hardest function to approximate? So that's, and in order to answer the second question, we also have to answer questions like the third one, which is universal bounds on approximating every Boolean function. So here we're interested in statements of the sort, every Boolean function can be 0.1 approximated by a DNF of size blah. OK, so these are the three questions uh, that we couldn't quite answer. And in this research, we make some progress on all three of them. Oh, so the theme of this, this paper is on trade-offs between accuracy and efficiency in circuit complexity. And what I hope to convince you is that you know, very basic and seemingly simple problems are open even for you know, very simple circuits like DNFs. So let me give you some of, let me go into more details about the three questions. OK, so we have this theorem of Lupanov, which I stated on my first slide, which is any DNF computing the parity function has to have size at least 2 to the n minus 1 and with at least n. Um, the first question you can ask is, does 0 0.1 approximating parity require size omega of 2 to the n? Or can you 0 0.1 approximate parity with size literal of 2 to the n? OK, so that's a qualitative question you can ask, and you can get more quantitative. So we, we could live in two different worlds. One where approximation is not much easier. It could be the case that 0 0.1 approximating parity requires size omega of 2 to the n, meaning you get not much more than a constant factor savings. Or approximation could make things a lot easier. You could 0 0.1 approximate parity with size 2 to the n over exponential in n. Right? We didn't know which world we live in. So that's size, and we can ask the same question about width. Right? Does 0 0.1 approximating parity require the n with n minus big O of 1, meaning you get nothing more than just a constant factor additive savings? Oh, can we 0.1 approximate parity with width n minus little omega of 1? All right, so that's a qualitative question again, and, and you can get quantitative. And as far as I know, before we started this research, uh, again, there was these two worlds where approximation was not much easier, and 0.1 approximating parity requires width n minus big O of 1, or approximation made things a lot easier. You could approximate parity uh, with size and, uh, with width n minus omega of n. Um, okay. Okay, so before I state 
our results, uh, let me answer a question that be, may be on some of your minds, which is, what does the switching lemma say? So I'm going to touch briefly on the work on correlation bounds between parity and AC0 and how our work re relates to it and how it differs from it. So this is a long and fruitful line of research. It started in the 80s. It's still active today. And the main message of this research is that a small AC0 circuit agrees with parity on a half plus tiny fraction of inputs. So here, tiny is a function of the size of your circuit, the depth of your circuit, and maybe n. OK? And just last year, Johann, a result of Johann implies that the correlation of any size s dnf with parity is at most 2 to the minus omega n of log s. So this is what I call tiny on the line above. So what does this say about the size of DNFs that agree with parity on 99% of inputs, which is the question that we are interested in for this work? It does say something, and does say something pretty strong. It says that any DNF that agrees with parity on 99% of inputs must have size 2 to the omega n. In particular, it cannot be, you cannot hope to get like 2 to the root n. But I claim that there's still some interesting work to be done, and which is what, I, what we do in this work. Uh, it still leaves open this exponential gap that I mentioned previously, whether the true answer is omega of 2 to the n, or versus an upper bound of 2 to the n over exponential in n. So there's this, st still this exponential gap that remains, and this is what we close. This is one of the things we close in this work. OK, so let me start describing our results. Our first theorem is an analog uh, of Lupanov's theorem. We show that every, for every epsilon approximating parity, we show that for every epsilon, parity can be epsilon approximated by a DNF of size 2 to the 1 minus 2 epsilon times n, and with 1 minus 2 epsilon times n. So for constant epsilon, this is exponential savings on size and linear savings on width. And we complement these upper bounds with almost matching lower bounds. We show that for every epsilon, any DNF that epsilon approximates parity requires size at least one, 2 to the 1 minus 4 epsilon times n, and width at least 1 minus 2 epsilon times n. So our bounds on width match exactly, and our bounds on size come close to matching, uh, modulo this like 2 versus 4 in the exponent. So that's our results for parity. And before I describe our other results, I just want to spend one slide on why this result is still a little surprising to me till today. Uh, let's focus on width. It says that parity can be epsilon approximated by dnf of width 1 minus 2 epsilon times n. So if you fix epsilon to be constant, this is n minus omega of n. And recall from my second slide that this means that parity can be 0.1 approximated or 0.01 approximated by the union of linear dimensional subcubes. Um, and by being linear dimensional, each subcube covers exponentially many points, right? And since the underlying function is parity, for every one I cover, I cover a zero as well. So if you just zoom in on one subcube in my approximator, I'm making error 50%, right? And yet, somehow, we can align the cubes in such a way that the overall error is 1%, uh, which seems pretty counterintuitive. And I'm going to prove this later, but just briefly, uh, the solution is to somehow get these cubes overlap very heavily over the zero inputs, meaning I double count my errors a lot, and yet be essentially disjoint over the one inputs. So I cover lots of one inputs. OK, so that's parity. So now we move on to more global questions about universal bounds. Uh, we saw that parity is the hardest function to compute exactly. Uh, is it true? Is it also the hardest function to compute, hardest function to approximate by DNFs? So our next result says no. Uh, any DNF that 0.1 approximates a random function has size at least 2 to the n over n. And recall our bound on size for parity. We show that parity can be epsilon approximated by a DNF of size at most 2 to the 1 minus 2 epsilon times n. So if you plug in epsilon constant here, you get exponential savings. So among other things, this shows that parity, despite being the hardest function to compute exactly, is in fact exponentially easier to approximate than almost every other function. OK, uh, so in light of this lower bound, we can ask, you know, what about upper bounds? In particular, a question that I really liked was, is there a function that requires size omega of 2 to the 1, 2 to the n, to 0.1 approximate? Or is it possible that every single Boolean function, we can get some sort of savings? And we show that, in fact, every single Boolean function, we can get some sort of savings. We show that every Boolean function can be 0.1 approximated by DNF of size at most 2 to the n over log n. OK, so that's size. Let me move on to width. OK, so a few slides ago, we saw that parity can be 0.1 approximated by the union of linear dimensional subcubes. Well, optimistically, we can ask, can we do this for every single Boolean function? And in fact, yes. We show that every Boolean function can be 0.1 approximated by, the D by DNF of width at most n minus omega of n, the union of linear dimensional subcubes, uh, which is pretty interesting. And one reason why it's interesting is 
it gives an interesting contrast between approximate and exact computation. A uh, very simple counting argument or probabilistic argument shows that in a random function, uh, every one monochromatic subcube, meaning a subcube with all ones, has dimension at most log n. Uh, so one way to look at our result is that we show that all, every single one of these cubes can be made exponentially larger at the cost of some small error, six so small constant error, 0 0.1. Okay, so that's our results. Let's prove some stuff. So I'm going to go sort of in the reverse order in which I presented the results. I'm going to start with our universal bounds first, starting with size and then going to width, and then closing off with our DNF approximator for parity. And I'll end off with some open problems. OK, so first theorem, every Boolean function can be 0 0.1 approximated by DNF of size at most 2 to the n over log n. So think of have in mind a random function, for example. How are we going to do this? What's our goal? Well, our goal is to put down a small family of subcubes, and by small, I mean 2 to the n over log n, uh, that covers almost all the one inputs but misses almost all the zero inputs. And it seems pretty tough. Uh, here's the first attempt. This is probably the most technical proof, and so I'm going to try to prove it three times, uh, starting with the first attempt. Uh, it's a very naive attempt. It's probably, it's not going to work, but as you'll see, it gets us very close. And it's a very simple idea. The first thing I'm going to do when I get this function is I'm going to randomly flip a tiny fraction of zeros to ones. Okay, and then the next step, I'm just going to put on every large one monochromatic sub Q. Okay, let's see how this does. There are three things we care about. The error on the zero inputs, the error on the one inputs, and the DNF size. Okay, I claim that we are happy. We get what we want for the error on the zero inputs. Well, what's our algorithm doing? We're flipping some zeros to ones and then putting down every one monochromatic sub Q. So you cannot cover too many zeros just you know, almost by definition from the algorithm. I claim we're also happy on the error on one inputs. Right? Fix any one input, as long as I can argue that any one input is covered by many large subcubes, then there's going to be a good chance that one of them will become monochromatic after this corruption process, and I'm going to cover it. But I claim that the one thing that doesn't quite make it is DNF size. Uh, and to see this, uh, it's a very simple example you can keep in mind. Imagine you're given a constant one function. What's this algorithm going to do? Well, the first step is going to randomly flip a tiny fraction of zeros to ones. Well, it's the constant one function. Nothing is going to get flipped. And the second step, you're going to include every single large one monochromatic sub cube. You're just going to put it down, put it down, put it down. And your DNF is going to be too big. Uh, so the, one, the obvious fix is, instead of including every single one of them, be slightly more careful about including which ones you want to include. Uh, but this is actually basically our algorithm. So let me show you the actual algorithm now. Again, the first step remains the same. I'm going to randomly flip every zero input to one with some tiny probability. The second step, I'm going to define what we call special subcubes, such that every x is contained in many special subcubes. OK? And the third step, I'm going to include every one monochromatic special subcube. And by that, I mean any special subcube that becomes all ones after the corruption process in my approximator with some small probability. And I claim that this fixes the problem I had on my previous slide. So for the same reason, since I'm flipping zeros to ones and putting down one monochromatic subcubes, I'm going to cover a tiny fraction of zeros. So my error on zero inputs is going to be good. Since every one input is, uh, is included in many special subcubes, there's going to be a good chance that one of them is going to become monochromatic after the corruption process. And we can argue that every one input is likely to be covered. And lastly, since every one monochromatic special subcube is only included with a small probability, well, your DNF is not going to be too big. OK, so let me prove it the third time with the actual proof. OK, so the first step, again, is to flip every zero input to one independently with probability at most epsilon over 2. So just by a simple churn-off bound at most with probability, with extremely high probability, and most epsilon of fraction of zero inputs is flipped. And then what am I going to do next? What I'm going to do next is to put down one monochromatic subcubes. So condition on this event, uh, my error on the zero inputs is going to be small. So that makes me happy. So there are two more things that we have to do. Uh, it remains to consider error on one inputs and the DNF size. So I'm going to prove in the next slide that with probability at least 3 quarters, the error on the one inputs is at most epsilon. And with probability at least 3 quarters, my DNF size is going to be at most 2 to the n over log n. And then just by a union bound, I'm going to get that there is some positive probability that all three things happen, and I, got, I get all three pro properties I want. OK, so it remains for me to justify these two things in green. 
So let d be log log n. Uh, don't worry too much about it. It's something that you choose carefully when the proof is complete. And we partition n into n over d blocks of size d. And what's a special subcube? A special subcube is one where all the stars, all the free variables, fall exactly in one of these blocks. Okay? And the observation here is that every input x is contained in exactly n over d special subcubes. So that's what a special subcube is. And the second step of my algorithm is I'm going to include every one monochromatic special subcube in my approximator with probability exactly epsilon to the 2 to the d. So why am I good for my error on one inputs? Well, for any one input x, I'm included in n over d special subcubes, each of which is included in my approximator with probability exactly epsilon to the 2 to the d. So the probability that you're not covered is exactly 1 minus this inclusion probability raised to the number of special subcubes, which is n over d. And by carefully choosing d, you get this to be at most epsilon over 4. OK? And how about size? Well, it's just the number of special subcubes multiplied by the probability that any subcube is included. So just by working on paper, you can convince yourself that this is the number of special subcubes. And multiplying it by epsilon to the 2 to the d, again, by our magical choice of d, this comes out to 2 to the n over log n. So by Markov of argument for both, we get what we want. So this proves our first result, uh, which is, again, that every Boolean function can be 0 0.1 approximated by dn of size at most 2 to the n over log n. OK, universal bound on dnf width. So again, I'm going to try to convince you that every Boolean function can be 0 0.1 approximated by a dnf of width at most n minus omega of n. So this is the union of linear dimensional subcubes. I'm going to fix d to be 0.001n, and my fi final approximator is going to have, have width n minus d, which is n minus linear in n. The first step is to cover 99.999% of the Hamming cube with roughly 10 times 2 to the n over volume d Hamming balls of radius d. Here, volume d is the volume of Hamming ball of radius d. And the way to think about this is that it's essentially a partition. Uh, in fact, for the rest of this proof, it's probably more convenient to just think of this as magically the numbers work out so that we can exactly partition the Hamming cube into the union of Hamming balls. And why do I say that this is essentially a partition? Well, with a partition, I'll cover 100% instead of 99.99%. And with a partition, I'll use 2 to the n over volume d Hamming balls instead of 10 times that. But it's essentially a partition. And for the proof, um, not being exactly a partition doesn't really hurt us too much. So we have divided, and then now we concur. Um, so we're going to zone in on one Hamming ball. I'm going to construct a small width DNF, and by small I mean n minus d, which is n minus linear n, DNF for each ball, satisf satisfying the following property. I'm going to be 99.9% .9 correct within this ball, and zero outside it. And what's my final approximator? My final approximator is just going to be the OR of all these sub-approximators. And why is my final approximator a small width DNF? Well, my approximator for every ball is going to be a small width DNF, and the OR of small width DNFs remain a small width DNF. OK, so it remains to justify this last part about constructing a small width DNF for these Boolean functions restricted to Hamming balls. And it's not so hard. So it's, you're given this Hamming ball, it, there's some Boolean function in, inside it, and then it's all zeros outside. The key observation here is that. Uh, 99.99% of the points lie on the surface of the ball. So it suffices to get it exactly correct on the surface, and I don't really care what happens inside the ball. And yet, but, but the key property is I have to be, my approximator has to be all zeros outside the ball. Well, I'm just going to use one term for every one input on the surface, and do this for every single point on the surface. And I'm going to be 100% correct on the surface, and because of the geometry of the hypercube, most points lie on the surface. So this is my approximator for the Hamming balls. And recall, the way I'm going to combine them is just going to take the OR of all these small width DNFs, which is going to be a small width DNF. OK, so that concludes the proof of our second theorem, which is that every Boolean function can be 0 0.1 approximated by a DNF with n most n minus linear n, the union of linear dimensional subcubes. OK, so for the last part of the talk, I'm going to qu quickly outline our DNF approximator for parity. So recall that our theorem is that parity can be epsilon approximated for every epsilon. Parity can be epsilon approximated by dnf of size at most 2 to the 1 minus 2 epsilon times n, and with at most 1 minus 2 epsilon times n. I'm going to prove this to you for epsilon being 1 quarter, and hopefully uh, you'll be convinced that we can generalize this for smaller epsilon.
So, okay, we want to compute the parity function. Given a string x, we would like to find out the parity of the bits in x. So the maybe natural thing to do is to divide x into two blocks, y and z. And make the obvious observation, first of all, that parity of x is a parity of y xort with a parity of z. So that's parity. What my, what's my approximator going to be? Well, I'm going to approximate this function with f of x being parity of y, not xort, but ord with the parity of z. And let's see how this does. First of all, I claim that if parity of x is indeed 1, then f of x will be 1. Well, if there are odd number of 1s in my string, then any partition, it cannot be split even-even. Because if it's split split even-even, the total is going to be even. So in this case, actually, my approximator is going to be exactly correct. So what if the parity of x is 0? Well, then half the time is split split even-even, and half the time is split odd-odd. In which case, my, my approximator is going to be correct half the time. So just by this very simple observation, we see that uh, f of x is a three-quarters approximator for parity. Uh, so what's the DNF size for f of x? Well, parity of y and parity of z, they are functions over n over 2 variables. So they have trivial DNFs ex computing exactly of size 2 to the n over 2 minus 1 and width n over 2. And you're ordering these two together, so the size multiplies by 2, the width stays the same. So we see that we can one-quarter approximate parity with size at most 2 to the n over 2 and width at most n over 2. And for smaller epsilon, you, you use more blocks instead of just two blocks, and you can get it for all epsilon greater than, uh, smaller than one quarter. OK, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, let me conclude with a few open problems. OK, so one thing we showed here is a universal upper bound that every Boolean function can be 0 0.1 approximated by a DNF of size at most 2 to the n over log n. And we show um, a lower bound of to the n over n against a random function. OK, so what in my mind is sort of a, f I would say this is a very fundamental question, is to close this gap and find out how exactly, um, what exactly the right bound is between 2 to the n over n versus 2 to the n over log n. And in fact, the question I like even more is that, is to find an explicit hard function showing giving a bound of at least 2 to the n over poly n. We know that this is not parity, and we know that a random function is going to be hard. but. I'm not sure what function is going to be. Even showing me a function that is strictly harder than parity, I'll be very happy to see. Right now, I, I do not have a candidate for a function that's strictly harder than parity. And I'll really like to come up with a function which I can prove, explicit hard function, which I can prove that any 0.1 approximator has to have size at least 2 to the n over poly n. I'm guaranteed that almost every function satisfies this. I'd like to find one explicit one. Thanks. Solutions to the open problems. The, um, the, um, the lower bound for random functions is by a counting argument. Yeah. Yeah. Counting combined with you know the fact that your approximator. Yeah. It's an information theoretic lower bound. Yeah. Let me. I tell him. Gurevich, which says that uh, a monotone function which is in AC0 need not be in monotone AC0. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if it's known that a monotone function in AC0 cannot even be approximated uh, in monotone AC0. And yeah. Also, you, don't, you can also talk about, you don't need to restrict to polynomial. You can yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, maybe... This question is relevant. Uh, yeah. Um, to a line of research. Yeah, with Eric and with Johan, uh, we're actually looking at a problem that's quite closely related, uh, which is that given a monotone function, if I want to compute it with a d small size DNF, it's clear that the DNF is going to be monotone as well. It's just a union of all min terms. And what we're interested in is if you just want to 0.1 approximate a monotone function, uh, is that function also going to be monotone? So that's sort of related to this ITI result on AC0. And the answer there is actually, at least to me surprisingly, no. That sometimes a non-monotone function can help you approximate a monotone function. So. Hey, uh, we'll meet again for open problems at uh, 3.40. And thanks, guys.
Four four. Yeah, no, no. So, 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 so